Okay, all right. Um, so just some a uh, few things from three weeks ago to just bring us back in. Oftentimes you hear people talking about, oh, I want to be a great person. I want to do great things in the world. Proverbs shows us a glimpse of how to do that. Um, uh, it was three weeks ago that we looked at that at that proverb where it says, you know, um, if if you if you control your mouth, you are greater than the person who 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 takes over entire cities. Obviously, it says it in a different way there, but if you're interested, you can just go back and rewatch the lesson on on, on our Facebook. Um, but you know that that's really the starting point. Of, if you wanted to be a great person, do great things. Watch what you say. Watch your temper and watch what you say. I mean, that that to me is just amazing because I you know I always thought growing up that you had to do something really great, like start start a really successful business or, or single-handedly save all of Asia or something, something you know, like something really great. And no, Proverbs says it's a lot harder than that. <laughs> you have to watch what you say. <laughs> oh, I have to watch my temper now? Okay, hold on. <laughs> um, also, we talked about the ends justify the means, and I gave it a lot of serious thought after we talked about it, and I think I have reached my own conclusion. Okay. I believe that the ends do not justify the means, but, but it's not that simple. How do I want to say this? Without encouraging bad attitudes towards others, God is our ultimate authority, not man. And so sometimes we have to break the laws of man to fulfill the laws of God. However, I don't believe that in doing that we ever have to sin in order to bring about a good result because of the proverb that we looked at a few weeks ago as well. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to destruction. And I think that that's sometimes what we do. We, oh, well, I'm going to do something good here. You know, we try to justify it because it seems right in our heads. Right. But then yeah. Proverbs says, that way seems right to a man, but is actually leading to destruction. And I kind of I kind of think that that's what, it, what it's talking about. We try to fix things and whatnot through sinning. Yeah. I'm going to do something greater. I'm going to I'm going to bring about this good result through sin. Well, we know that nothing good comes from sin, so the ends can't possibly justify the means. However, sin can be justified. Tech, not I, let me re-say that. Breaking the law can be justified if it's man's law and we're doing it to preserve God's law. For instance, um, if the government makes us have an abortion, you know, have an abortion for every child after the first or second like China did, okay? Um, well, we could obviously, hopefully, try and prevent the pregnancy, but if, if that didn't work, you know, we, we would have to not kill our child, even though it would put us in danger because we believe that the Bible tells us not to do that. Yeah. See what I mean? Or um, it, smuggling Bibles is another great example um, where the government says no, and God told us to reach out to all the peoples. We can't Accept that as a as a as an actual option for us, and um, I have a great little pamphlet on is smuggling Bibles um, a good thing um, that was sent to me by Voice of the Martyrs. If you guys would like, I can show it next week if you would like. Yeah, yeah. okay. And it, it basically you know shows it, it, in summation. It basically says stuff like this. Um, uh, Peter was trying to escape the prison. Uh, when he was in, you know, in, in prison and the angel was leading him out. And then he stopped the angel and said, Angel, is this ethically right for you to take me out of prison? I mean, isn't, isn't that, isn't that, aren't I breaking the law? And then the soldier comes and kills Peter. And that was the, and they have a bunch of little examples like that. And they're, and they're saying, you know, we're not trying to be blasphemous or try to, you know, make fun of the Bible. We're pointing out the fact that sometimes in order to fulfill God's command, it's necessary to circle. Another great example, Book of Exodus. Um, Pharaoh's are like, okay, any babies that are born that are male, just throw them into the Nile and be done with them, right? And then the midwives say, we can't do this. But then when Pharaoh says, why haven't you killed these babies? They don't say, we don't believe that it's right. Or they don't say, we're afraid of God. They say this instead. They say, uh, they're having them too quickly, which was a lie. They could have killed the babies, oh, yeah. but they chose not to because they feared God more so. See what I mean? So here's here's what I really want to want to warn against. Ultimately, in America at least, you're not really going to have to worry about this too much. This is mostly for your own theorizing, okay? Um, it, it is, this does happen, however, in other nations. 
quite frequently. So I want you to be aware of it without trying to encourage a rebellious attitude in you. Okay, we don't need to look for opportunities to rebel. But when it comes to a matter of faith and there's no other option and there's no way to make peace in the situation and it's the very last resort, well then it's the very last resort. Okay, so, uh, so in my opinion, know the ends do not justify the means. Um, although God does still know best, and we have to be careful that we're not just jumping the gun and we're actually listening to what he has to say. And the last thing I wanted to say before we get to Proverbs chapter 19 um, is something that Gracie brought up. And she brought up the proverb uh, that... You know where it says there's a friend that's closer than a brother, and she said, "I had already, people had always told me that that was Jesus." So that's where we have to remember this very important principle that applies to every single book of the Bible: is it true or is it right? Is it true that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother? Yes. Is it right, and is that what this passage was trying to say? No. So it wasn't right, although it was a true statement. See, this is oftentimes what people do, especially televangelists. They, they, something sounds good, and so they just kind of stick with it, because it sounds good. And you know what? In a lot of times, they're justifying a principle that is true. You know, God wants us to watch our anger. Yeah, that, that's a good principle. That's not what this passage was saying, though. See you know what I mean? Right. Um, like, uh, oh boy. That's not a good example, because that would take on a whole nother... <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? You can't... You look at a passage, and maybe that conclusion that you got was 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 a true was a, a true conclusion, but it wasn't what the passage was trying to teach. So it wasn't right. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Always be concerned with, with it being right before you are concerned with expanding what it's saying to apply to things that are true. Okay? Awesome. And that's something you're going to have to be faced with for the rest of your life in reading the Bible. There will always be things that come up that sound really good, and you have to always stop and ask the question, is this what this is actually saying? So, awesome. So that takes us to Proverbs chapter 19. And there were a lot of uh, verses in here that I found that were a little bit difficult to understand. So there's going to be a lot of notes for those of you who take notes. <laughs> If you don't, like Zach, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> right. Okay, everybody ready? Better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. Now, did you catch what he just said? He contrasted being poor. So you'd think the next line would have something to do with being rich, right? Yeah. No, not even mentioned. Better is a poor person who walks in integrity. Basically, it is it is good is better than the crooked ways of fools, even if it brings poverty. Doing the right thing, even no matter what the results, that's still better than the foolish ways and the crooked ways of the fool. So, once again, you would think that he would be contrasting the poor with someone else, but his point is his main point is it's better to lose all for the sake of doing good than it is to, you know, go on the crooked way. Regardless of whether the crooked way leads you to riches or poverty. He's not even concerned about your material possessions in this proverb, which I think was the thing that really caught me off guard. So then verse 2, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. Desire is not enough. You know, um... Oftentimes, we are passionate about something. We greatly desire to do something, but that's not enough. Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. You know what I mean? Desire to reach people, but... Okay, here's a good example. I was reading this book, Waking the Dead. And there was this girl who wanted to go as a missionary, but she wanted to do it as a teacher, kind of like an incognito thing, because it was a... It was a highly restricted nation. So she went over as a teacher, but she just got gung-ho and she went. She didn't really plan or anything. Um, and she had a history of of, um, of, of abuse. Uh, her People abusing her, not her abusing other people. Um, and so she went without 
getting really prepared emotionally first. And as a result, things just kind of happened, and, and she kind of just crumbled. And she came back in the eyes of other people as a failure. In the eyes of herself as a failure. Um, we don't know if she'll be back or not. See what I mean? Potentially, her ministry is over. Because... Here what I'm saying, it was a good thing that she desired to do that. But there was no knowledge along with that. You know, there are counselors, for instance. There, there are people who, who are there to help us. You know, um, sometimes uh, for certain situations, not for every situation, but for some situations, there's medications and stuff to help us. But desire without knowledge is not good. And whoever makes makes haste with his feet misses his way. And I was a perfect example of that. Uh, verse three: When a man's folly brings, um, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. That one is uh, pretty important to me because I've seen this happen repeatedly in my life um, through different things that have happened with different people that I was close to. Basically, I don't want to change my way, and then when I'm led to destruction, it's somebody else's fault. It's God's fault. God, why did you let this happen to me? I see this happen all the time in ministry here. And this is hard as an associate pastor because you want to tell somebody what they're doing wrong. But they don't want to listen. And then it all falls apart and you can't say, I told you so, because you're a pastor. Yeah. You're trying to help them get better. You're not trying to beat them over the head for messing up. Right. Yeah. Even though you want to beat them over the head for messing <laughs> up because you tried to tell them they wouldn't listen. Right. And so this is something as a pastor you see all the time. And you have these, these feelings that are very frustrating. Because on one side you feel empathy for them, but then on the other yeah, side you're exactly. completely apathetic. You're just like, yeah. I'm tired of dealing with you. You know, and, you, and and as a pastor, you know you shouldn't feel that way, but then you still do. And so you, you feel guilty for feeling that way, but then you still feel pretty sure that you were right and they are wrong. And so you just have this circular mess, mess of feelings. Yeah. <sighs> And uh, very, very, I think this one, this one you're going to want to highlight, though. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart brings, or his heart rages against the Lord. Somebody else's fault. Verse 4, wealth brings many new friends. But a poor man is deserted by his friend. Once again, this is not condoning it. This is simply saying how it is. Wealth brings many new friends. When, when there's someone who's rich, people crowd around him. They all want a piece of the richness. But if it's a poor man... Even his friends desert him. That he has nothing to offer. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. Now, I want you to notice this. This is a common theme throughout Proverbs. The idea that God will ultimately repay such evil treacheries as false witness. Imagine this, okay? This is not going to be that hard for you to imagine because it has happened before. A woman is raped. And in court, uh, false witnesses come up, and the, rape, the rapist... Yeah is completely exonerated and the girl who's raped just has to live with it. That's a pretty unjust situation. But, have no fear because the powers like this show us that God does care and even though man's courts are skewed, yeah. God's aren't. And God does hold those people as not blameless. Um, Obviously, there's forgiveness, and I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying that God does definitely is a God of justice, too. Were you going to say something? Yeah, and it could also be the other way around, too, where yeah. somebody's falsely yeah. accused, yeah. and then they still get charged for it. Yeah. Um, here's a great example. There's a guy named Bill Gothard. Most of you guys probably don't know him. And he pretty much lost his whole ministry, not because of a proven situation, but because of something that could have happened. The, the, what was against him was that there were a bunch of girls who said that he did it. But n none of those girls had witnesses. None of those girls had anybody who could vouch for their character. Yeah. None of those girls could provide any proof. None of those girls could... It, it was years after the fact. So, But then, once again, that is kind of common for someone who's, someone who's been raped. So it's like, it could go either way. But, do so, you see what I'm saying here? Yeah. So it's not proven, but yet his ministry was still... And as a pastor, here's what we really got to watch out for. All it takes for my ministry to completely end is for somebody to say, He touched me. That's it. Because it doesn't matter what the reality is. 
Does it does, even if I'm proven proven un, not guilty in in court? Doesn't matter. My ministry is over. Yeah. So I mean, I have to resign from the church and move on. And I, and here's the thing: I have to actually move too, because as long as I'm here, the church is going to have a tarnish on their name. People are going and going to see me as the one who raped that person, even though I didn't. Right. See what I mean? All that it takes is for for that to get out, and that's the end of it. I know I know a guy who who peed, who peed in a in a park, and was caught, and so now he's tagged as a child molester, even though all he did was peed. <laughs> Granted, I mean you shouldn't pee in public, but I mean there were no kids there, nothing happened, but still tagged as a child molester. Do you see what I mean? And it just takes that little thing to, yeah. you know. Anyways. Um, actually, I know a couple people who that happened to. Yeah. Uh, I don't even remember who some of them are. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> um, I remember... I remember something about talking to them about it, and I don't remember who they are. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, huh? <laughs> anyways. Anyways, I'm getting off topic here. Um, Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. This kind of goes along with verse four: wealth brings many new friends. The idea that you can you can pretty much buy friends. Now, here's the thing, though: it's not necessarily good friends. Just that you'll always be surrounded by people. Yeah. Now, anybody who who's been dealt with depression or anything knows that you can be surrounded by a lot of people and still feel alone. So. Uh -huh. Okay. Verse seven: all the poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursues them with words, but does not have them. How, how, how sad is that, that the poor man may actually have something good to say. He may actually be a wise person. Verse 8. <laughs> Whoever gets sense loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will discover good. Now, we talked about this in previous ones, how seeking after wisdom affects us, and it's a good thing for us. Um, and in fact, one part in Proverbs says, if you get wisdom, you get it for yourself, and if you reject wisdom, you alone will bear it. It kind of goes hand in hand with this. Verse 9, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will perish. Verse 10, it is not fitting for a fool to live in luxury, much less for a slave to rule over princes. Now, I got the first part pretty easy. It's not it's not fitting for a fool to live in luxury, but it's the second part that confused me. So basically, fools don't earn it, and they don't appreciate it. It's unfitting for a fool to live in luxury. They didn't get it. They don't know how to spend it. They don't value it. You know, you see what I mean? They, 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 they're, they're all about their own, um, well, their own selfish, de selfish desires. And so when they're given this, it just, it's used for immoral things. It's, it, it's just unfitting for them. So, I mean, it, it's not right. Um, much less uh, for a slave to rule over a princess. So basically, uh, a slave given them what's not theirs leads to oppression and foolishness. If a slave were to become a master over the princess, you know, without having earned something he would then go back and, and return that oppression for oppression because people who are hurt hurt people. Um, and so uh, a better example would be maybe earning the way. Yeah. Uh, if we were to put it in modern day context, uh, the peon at Walmart who suddenly places a store manager. Well, they don't have any of the skills. They're not right for the job. They, they didn't prove themselves as a hard worker. They just, see what I mean? They're just bad things. The whole store will get messed up. It's not good for the structure, and that's kind of what he's saying. Uh, verse 11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. I'm going to read that again, because this one's really one of those key Proverbs. All of Proverbs is important, but there's some that are just, in my opinion, a little more important. And this is one of those more important ones. Good sense makes one slow to anger. Slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. Don't bring it back up. Don't talk to them about it after the fact. Don't continue to get hurt about it after it's already done. But just overlook it. Let it go. <laughs> uh, let it go. That's another, another way of saying it. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Verse 12. A king's wrath is like the growling of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. Um, now, this kind of this is about kings. We don't really have a king in America, obviously, uh, but it still applies to leaders more general. You know, um, it, when the, when a leader um, when the, when a leader is upset, I mean, anybody who's worked at Walmart knows this. You know, like, rah, 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 you know, <laughs> but you know, when you when you do something good, you know, and and you and you uh, earn his favor. It's like the dew on the grass. It's a good thing. It's refreshing. Yeah. Leaders have the ability to bring refreshing or destruction. 
And that's a that's a powerful thing. Yeah. Okay, remember that if you're ever in, in leadership. Um, a foolish uh, son is a ruin. Uh, I'm sorry. A foolish son is ruined to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. So, I'm going to say this in a little bit more of a broad way. Churches are affected by folly and strife too. This isn't just the household that is. Okay. When when people do foolish things, it brings shame. Foolishness brings shame. Okay. Now listening to people having to do things your own way, being quick to anger, you know, constantly shooting off your mouth, these things bring shame in your life. Um, and then uh, causing strife is something that, that, that it tears apart the fabric of the house. But it also tears apart the fabric of the church. It also tears apart the fabric of the nation. See, what happened is America was founded as a bunch of people who couldn't get along with people in England. But... What happened was because of all the slaves being imported, it became not just a predominantly white country anymore. And then it was white, and and and, and, and African Americans were also lar uh, getting to be more and more, more and more not a minority. But then with um, the Mexican and uh, American border being next to each other, there's also the increase of immigrations there, immigrants there. Um, and then, as you guys know, in the 1900s, the, Ir the Irish settlers came, and just so many different things. Um, uh, fun fact, the Irish were actually treated how uh, Mexicans were a couple years ago. Huh. And I just thought that was funny, because now Ir Irish people, that's not even a thing anymore. Yeah. But whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, but my point being this, that now America is more like, um, it's not a, a white nation. It, it's, no. it's a nation of, of nationless people. You know what I mean? Whereas in Ireland, you had Irish people. In England, you had English people. Well, not so much anymore. In Iran, you had Iran people. Iranians. Uh, in, in China, you had China. Well, that's a bad example because there's so many different people groups <laughs> yeah. there. But uh, And so what's happening is America is, is kind of just this, this hodgepodge. Yeah. You know, um, we have our tradition... You know, Christmas to be celebrated, and then you have the new tradition, which is people might not, that might not be the people's culture. And so our culture isn't necessarily our culture anymore. It's actually a culture of cultures. You know, and, 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 and uh, there's just, it's not ever going to go back to the way it was because it's not a white nation of religious people running for religious freedom. It's not that anymore. It's, It's just changing its 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 what it looks like, how it acts, who what it is. It's it's not the same person anymore. Okay. But what I'm saying is, um, going back to this, the idea that that folly and strife can't can't bring something together, and so you have different people groups still not understanding the way that America is turning into, you know, and trying to restore things to how it was in the past. And, in, and so as a result, what we're getting is we're getting riots. Um, we're getting people just acting kind of stupid. Um, you have people, you know, causing problems and people reacting to the problems. And nobody really wants to bring peace to the situation. They all want to be heard. You know, all the white people, oh, you guys need to get over it. All the black people, oh, you guys need to need to do this. All the natives, oh, you guys need to... See, I mean, nobody wants to bring peace to the situation. And so you have a nation of nations... And we're all acting like individual nations within that nation. We're not acting like a united whole. Right. And I think that is a great example for the household and for the church. Because the church is supposed to be that too. It's supposed to be a nation of nations. See what I mean? It's supposed to be a hodgepodge. M marriages too. You marry someone who's not, hopefully, that's incest, hopefully not from your family. <laughs> right. uh, and so you, you bring their culture into your culture and you make your own new culture right. so I mean and in order for there to be this unity between these these family units be it a church a nation a actual family whatever it is in order for there to be unity in these family units there cannot be foolishness and strife right. there has to be peacemaking were you gonna say something uh, I wasn't I can't remember what it was <laughs> oh going back to what you said about uh, how a country kind of acts like different 
just different nationalities. I was thinking that we just our country basically acts like a bunch of five year olds fighting for the same tour. No comment. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so, um, a foolish son is ruined to his father, and a wise quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. You know, on another note, I will say this. Even if you're the most spiritual person, the smartest person in the world, what you marry into could possibly break you. Yeah. I'm just going to leave it there, because I don't want to go out and talk about sexism and all that nonsense. I mean, it's great. Verse 14, house and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. So here we see her belonging is contrasted with the wise wife. Um, house and wealth, those are things that, that you thought you could inherit from your father's household. But a wife, you couldn't inherit that from anything. You know, that was something that was that was um, well the Lord's the Lord's favor. So um, softness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. And I'm, I think that this applies more than just physical. It applies to moral, physical, and spiritual. When you start backing off in things, it brings about a deep sleep in your spirit, in your morals. Have you ever noticed how when somebody permits something in their, in their life that they know is a sin, they just kind of get more and more lax with it? You know, at first, um, you're having premarital sex with this person, and it's not that big of a deal, right? And then you're less trying to hide it, you don't feel as ashamed, then you're doing it with someone else. See what I mean? And it just gets to be this thing of like a landslide. Um, or uh, spiritually, you know, um, oh, I'm just not going to pray for today because I'm just not, I'm kind of tired. So then what happens? Then it leads to another day. And it leads to another day. Slothfulness casts into deep sleep. And an idle person will suffer hunger. And I think that, that applies too to physical hunger, spiritual hunger, moral hunger. Um, whoever keeps the commandment keeps his life. He who despises his ways will die. His ways being God's ways. Um, <clears throat> verse 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. In other words, God, you have God's divine protection as you provide for the poor. However, word of warning, just because you give your possessions to the poor doesn't mean that God's going to give you finances. Okay, So let me explain what that means. I only have five dollars left after I've paid all my bills, and I would kind of like to be able to eat. But I'm going to go ahead and give this to a poor person because God has to give me five dollars back after I give it to the poor person. If God was going to make money just randomly appear in thin air, don't you think he would have just given it to the poor person in the first place? Right. So still be wise with your finances, okay? Don't get yourself into physical, into debt and be like, well, God was supposed to... No, you were supposed to plan. Um, but it is still a good thing to be generous to the poor. 18. Dis uh, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Now, in the Old Testament law, there was this thing where if you had a rebellious son, um, he could, he, you could, you could put him to death for it. Well, give me the crazy eyes, guys. Okay. Um, it would be something where you brought him to, out to the elders and he'd be stoned. Which is where you, it's exactly how it sounds. You pick up stones and you kill them. Um, so this is kind of, kind of um, giving the other side of that. Yes, the law does permit you to kill your child if they are a, a rebellious, wicked person. Okay. However, go ahead and discipline your son, which is um, two, twofold in, in Hebrew thought. It's not as we we think discipline as getting them in trouble. It's getting them in trouble plus instructing them as the situation calls for it. Basically what he's saying is, be involved with your child, especially before they've been set in their ways, um, and, 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 and give them grace. Don't get, don't get so mad with them that, you, you know, don't, yes, they're going to make mistakes, just be patient. Be patient. And, and I'll read that part again. Um, Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Be slow to do something just because you can do something legally in the law doesn't mean you should do it. Okay? The law permitted that you could send your wife away if, if uh, on divorce, um, not for her cheating, but if you were just not happy with her in the law, if you've read the Old Testament law. However, it doesn't require you to. You don't have to. Just because your wife doesn't make you happy doesn't mean you have to divorce her. It just gave you the ability to do it. In other words, 
God gave people an out because he realized that people are hard-hearted people. They would rather get divorces than, than, than work situations out. Yeah. Usually. Yeah, I know that there's all there's different situations where people have gotten divorced, and sometimes people get divorced when they don't want to get divorced, and sometimes people get divorced because they're being abused. Or, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the general standard in America where it's like a buffet. You know, you marry a person somebody because they're hot, why not? And then it doesn't work because you didn't think it through at all, and you have nothing in common. And so then you decide, rather than trying to learn about the person, rather than trying to adapt to the person, you just divorce them. Which is very common in America. Um, but anyways, I'm getting off topic again. <clears throat> people uh, Believe people will change. Believe that they will change. Don't get mad beyond reconciliation with people, okay? Um, mold what you can. But here, check this out. If you do not discipline your child, your failure combines with their failure. In other words, if you do not discipline your child, and they go off and do something immoral, you are... are you share the guilt with them. Does that make sense? If you did discipline them and they just rebelled against you, you absolve yourself from, from the guilt because you did your part, part that God told you to do. Right. But when we neglect what God told us to do and our child uh, strays, then God holds us guilty too. Okay? So, um, discipline your son for there is hope. And uh, once again, the bigger principle there being that um, believe people will change. Don't write people off and just say, you know what, that's just it. Um, verse 19, a man of great wealth, I'm sorry, wrath, will pay the penalty for if you deliver him, now hear this, you will only have to do it again. You see parents oftentimes do this. Their child gets into jail. They get, they get arrested, so they go bail them out. They get in jail again, so they bail them out. They get in jail again. See what I mean? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have compassion and empathy. But I am saying that sometimes helping people involves not helping them. Okay? Yes, and you have to really be smart with this and listen to God. Because sometimes God will tell you something that doesn't sound wise. I was reading Wake from the Dead again, and he had a flight that left on September 11th in 2001 um, to go start um, to go do some stuff uh, um, in, in another country, and he felt in his spirit that he should ask for the flight to be moved to the 10th instead. As it turns out, all the international flights were turned down that day because of the little thing called the blowing up of the Twin Towers. <laughs> Remember that? Uh -huh. <laughs> Said, I mean, so you have to, you have to, sometimes things just don't sound wise, and you have to let God be the final authority. But if God doesn't say anything specific, like, hey, don't do that, just follow his, wor his words on what wisdom is. Okay. It's not wise for me to co-sign on this loan. And then God says, uh, now hold on, this time I want you to do this. Well, most of the time God's not going to tell us to do that, because it's not wise, and God doesn't tell us to do things that are not wise. However, there are always exceptions to the rules where... Things just didn't go how we thought that they would. I don't know how to explain that, and Proverbs doesn't even try to explain it. It just says that that's how it is. So yeah. I'm just going to do what Proverbs says and say, well, that's just how it is. Um, okay, so verse um, 20. <clears throat> Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Once again, that you may gain wisdom in the future. Okay. Verse 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And uh, I don't want you to think that this is fatalistic. Why even do anything in life? Nothing I do will matter anyways. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is that people like to feel like they're in control of everything. And they plan a hundred different things. I'm going to go to Africa this summer, and I'm going to start a, a, a fitness center, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a master of the industry, and... Well, those are the plans of your heart. If you've ever lived, if you've ever been a person and lived, you've probably had about a billion dreams, and not all billion of your dreams can come true. That's okay. Some of us have, have limitations uh, mentally. I know I, I have that problem. Um, seems like no matter how much I learn, I still tend to be pretty clueless on some stuff. You know, 
Um, some of us have, have limitations with physically, like Chuck is in a wheelchair, for instance. You know, we're not, we can't all do everything that we desire to do. And, you know, some of us just can't understand something, no matter how many times it's, it's spoken to it, you know. And, and so then people who can understand a lot of different things um, will then go and say, you're just not trying hard enough. You know? Some people just aren't able to, aren't able to learn. So, um, um, but it is the purpose of the Lord that we stand. In other words, you can't thwart what God's going to do. God is going to do what he's going to do, and man's plans can't thwart that. Um, verse 22, what is desired in a man is steadfast love, and a poor man is better than a liar. Verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Obviously, this doesn't mean that nothing bad happens to good people. We've already talked about this a hundred times. Verse 24, the sluggard buried, uh, buries his hand in the dish. Where did I leave off? Right there. Um, and will not even bring it to his mouth. Now, this is a broader principle than, than just saying here. And the broad, broader principle is this. Um, sluggard, sluggish people, slothful people, lazy people, they start things, but they won't finish them. Yeah. They, If you go to their houses, they have a thousand to do items on their list, and they don't do any of them. So, I mean, they start things and won't finish them. Um, I always give the example of when I was in college, um, I had this roommate that would heat something up in the microwave at 6 o'clock at night, and 8 o'clock he'd reheat it because he forgot to grab it, then 10 o'clock, then, then 1 o'clock, and all throughout the night, uh, beep, 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 and I was like, ah, uh, make it stop. You start something, but you won't finish it. Yeah. See what I mean? Um, he who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. Now, obviously, he's not singling those things. Like, for instance, well, if you do violence to your mother, that's okay. But if you do violence to your father, he's not saying that at all. He's saying it's kind of like just a poetical way of saying when you do violence to your parents or when you chase them away and won't listen to their advice, when you just, you know, don't have anything to do with them or whatever, um, violence just you violence them and chasing chase them away. And that is the son who brings shame or reproach. Obviously, once again, don't get caught in sexism. He's not saying only if a son does this, if a daughter does that too. Okay, it's just the way that it was written. I know people get way off topic with sexism and all that nonsense. That wasn't a factor back here and back then. They didn't have the, you know, women's lib and, and feminism. And all. They didn't have that back then. Okay, so they didn't. Ha he didn't have to write it in such a way where it was politically correct by today's standards. Um, anyways. And so the idea there being, you know, if you do if you do violence and, and, and don't pay attention to your parents and, you, and you're and you're chasing them away, you bring shame and reproach to yourself, to them, to the situation, um, and it will come uh, be one of those things that comes back on you. I forgot to go to this point on 25. Sorry, guys. Uh, as Scott, now um, I did want to say this uh, because I actually forgot to mention. I'm glad I made this note. The, verse 25 actually mentions three different people: the scoffer, the simple, and the understanding. Let's go through it again. Strike a scoffer, and the simple will learn prudence. Reprove a man of understanding, he will gain knowledge. Strike a scoffer. This is somebody who's hard-hearted. They won't listen to what you have to say. They have a closed mind. But if you strike the scoffer, the simple person will learn prudence. A simple person isn't the same person as the scoffer. They're two different words. Okay. The scoffer is the person... I'm sorry. Uh, the simple is the person who is not that they have a closed mind. They just have an empty mind. Foolish, they're, you know, they're not a scoffer, but they just don't know any better. And if you reprove a scoffer, the scoffer won't pay attention. They won't, they're not going to listen to you anyways, because they're a fool. However, if you get the scoffer in trouble anyways, the simple person will learn from you getting the scoffer in trouble. Do you understand that? Yeah. Sometimes you enforce things not because people are going to listen to you, but because the other people will listen to what happens in that situation. And I was going to mention this a few times over the next chapter here. Sometimes you get people in trouble just to keep other people. Not because you actually think that they're going to listen. Sometimes, you know, like the death penalty and stuff. Well, this person did this. You know, if, if, if it's a set law that we don't allow this, and we make it a public ordeal, then the next person is more deterred. There's more chances that they won't do it. See what I mean? But reprove a man of understanding. Now, this isn't somebody who has a closed mind or an empty mind. This is someone who has an open mind. Reprove a man of understanding, and he will gain knowledge. 
he's already a man of understanding, but he'll gain from the situation either way. So, I forgot to mention that. Sorry about that, guys. Um, that takes us back to verse 26, 7, I believe. Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will strike from the words of knowledge. And that's what I said about wisdom as an ongoing pursuit. So, a worthless witness uh, mocks at justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Now, I do want to put this forward as, as, a, as a pondering, my own personal pondering. When you see people mock at justice, there's a good chance that they won't give a, an accurate testimony in court. They won't give accurate accounts of stuff. Um, because they don't have a high, high respect for it. Justice is the same as you can bet somebody who's making fun of police officers, for instance, is probably not somebody who's real set on obeying the law. Not always. Not always. But usually. Condemnation is ready for scoffers and beating for the backs of fools. Basically, they get themselves in trouble and... And that's just the result of how it's going to go. So any questions on 19 before we go to 20? No? Okay. Verse 20, chapter 20, verse 1. Now this is one that blew my mind, guys. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led straight by it is not wise. Did you hear what you just said? The drink itself was criticized, not the person who drank the drink. Listen, wine is a mocker, and strong drink is a brawler. In other words, what he's saying is when you ingest alcohol, you will a mocker, you lose your sense, you do a bunch of things you wouldn't normally do, what people call doing dumb things. And a brawler, you start fights, you get violence, you do dumb stuff. <laughs> I mean <laughs> uh, I mean, that's pretty pretty simple there, but notice how he how he singled out the drink. Yeah. Not the person who drank the drink. Now, this is important because when we get towards the end of Proverbs, it's going to do the exact opposite. It's going to say, give this person alcohol. Now, we'll get to it when we get there, but just keep reading. I believe it's in Proverbs 30. If it's not 30, it's 29 or, or 31. It's somewhere in those last three chapters. Huh. Now, we'll get to it when we get there, so don't don't go and read it and say, what? It says this? Huh. We'll get back to it, guys, one day at a time. <laughs> but, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. See, once again, it's not necessarily that, that drinking is inherently wrong, okay? It's that drink itself is a stupid thing. Alcohol is a stupid thing. It doesn't produce anything good, okay? But, if you, what does he say, are led astray by it, you're not wise. <laughs> In other words, if you allow yourself to get drunk. <laughs> Does that make sense? Basis, well, not necessarily an everyday basis, just that you allow yourself to get drunk. Yeah. Because it only takes one time to mess yourself up. Uh -huh. Let's say, for instance, you send nudie pictures to your boss oh, and you oh. get fired. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because when you're drunk, you do stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay. Especially for you. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, Dad would just say, seen it. Because <laughs> I was a baby once. Yeah. Okay. Don't make that dirty, guys. <laughs> Verse 2. Uh, the terror of a king is like the growling of a lion. Whoever provokes him uh, to anger forfeits his life. And the idea here is goes beyond a, a king. It is not wise to patronize those in authority. Don't make fun of your bosses. Don't say snide comments. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> if your boss is angry, don't go on and on about how, you, how they shouldn't be mad at you because you didn't do anything wrong. Just either be quiet or bring peace to the situation, but... Remember that. The terror of, of a king, of a leader, of a boss is like the growling of a lion. Whoever, whoever provokes him to anger forfeits his life. Verse 3. Uh, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, to keep far off from strife. But every fool will be quarreling. How can you tell somebody's a fool? Are they always fighting? <laughs> hmm. Or are they always fighting with certain people? Because this is what fools do. They isolate themselves from a bunch of people and just surround themselves with people who pat them on the back all day telling them how great they are. And so then that once in a while that they're around that person who doesn't do that, they're fighting with them. Uh, See what I mean? Uh, so, uh, verse uh, 4. The slugger does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Now this is something that is a little bit hard for us to understand, understand here, uh, mostly because none of us are... are, are Farmers, and secondly, because we don't live in the Middle East. But let me just kind of sum it here. Autumn was a cold, wet, and miserable time. 
cold, wet, and miserable. You wouldn't want to go outside and work because it's cold, wet, and miserable. You can come up with a thousand excuses why you shouldn't go out because it's cold, wet, and miserable. <laughs> so, uh, it's not like the, the sluggard has an excuse. Oh, but it's autumn. Oh, it's bad out there. But here's the thing. If you plant then, you'll actually have a crop. But the thing is, is this proverb is a little bit ambiguous. He could be saying that they did, that, that the foolish person did plow, they just either didn't do a good job or they didn't finish. So that when he goes out at harvest, he has nothing in other words he's looking and he barely has anything. But it could also be saying this, that he didn't go out at all and therefore he doesn't have anything. But it could also be saying this, <laughs> the slugger does not plow in the autumn, but then he will seek, seek out, he will ask for help. In the, in the harvest time, like, hey, can I have some food? Because he won't have anything himself. But it could also be read like this. <laughs> so many different ways, guys. This is kind of a, this is kind of a hard proverb to pinpoint. Um, let me think. Um, he didn't help contribute, but he wants a piece of the pie. Could be a lot of those, or maybe he's going for a, for a multitude of, of, of interpretations. But just a few things for you to think about. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to tell you which one because they all are, are pretty firm in their reasoning and they all are true. So uh, I'm not even going to try and uh, pinpoint one over the other. Uh, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Hidden things of the heart can only be pulled out by the understanding person. This is a great proverb for why we should go to counselors. Okay, let's read that again, okay? The purpose in a man's heart is like deep waters. It's hidden in it. Sometimes we don't even know it ourselves. It's, it's things that are, they're like deep waters, you know? We scratch at the surface, but there's still something more. And because it's water, we don't know how deep it goes. But a man of understanding is able to draw it out. He's able to draw the waters out, draw the depth of the heart out, okay? Does that make sense? Someone that right. Surely, have you ever have you ever had something that you realized too late that you were doing it for the wrong motives? Yeah. Because of the deep waters of your heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find? It? There's a band called Thrice, and they have this song that says pretty much the same thing. It says, "Many will tell you they'll give you their love, but when they say t uh, give, they mean take." And it's very, very common in today's society. Oh, baby, I love you. And then you have sex, and they leave you. Many people boast of their own love and how great they are. But a faithful man who can find. This is coming from Solomon. Mr. I have thousands upon thousands of women that I have sex with. I have more women than there are days of the year. I could alternate my women through the course of over three years and still only be with one of them each one day. That's a lot of women, guys. That's just gross. Um, I mean, I kind of understand, as a man, I can understand how some cultures could justify having two or three wives. Because, you know, guys, you know, and then the women have, you know, their times and they're just like, I don't, don't touch me tonight. I'm, you know, everyone gets pregnant. I can understand. I'm not justifying. I'm saying I can understand how a culture that does justify it, the men could justify it. I'm not justifying it, okay? I think it's wrong and disgusting. You should only have one wife. I can understand how they could, but I don't get how you could have a thousand women. I just don't get that. I, I, I don't see how that would even be like a realistic thing. Like, eh, why not you? Eh, why not you? I haven't even been attracted to a thousand, years, a thousand women in my entire life. <laughs> Maybe if I were to round up all the women I've ever been attracted to my whole life, I might have like 20? Maybe? But we're talking about Solomon had like a thousand women, guys. That's a lot of women. Yeah. Jeez, that's a lot. <laughs> okay. Anyways, um, <clears throat> so I think that he would know about this. A faithful man who can find. That's Solomon talking there. Who can find? <laughs> uh, the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. When we do the good thing, it benefits our kids after us. It benefits them by we teach them morals. It benefits them by because we live with, with wisdom, we're able to have something to give to them. And also, it benefits us because God places a blessing on us, which then we're able to give to our children. You know, God was with us. So then, as our children grow up, we're able to tell our kids, God was with us. He blessed us in this. You know, this wasn't something that I did. This is something God brought in our family. 
blessings that God brought to us. You're able to hand that down to them, and they're able to walk with that knowledge. And as they, they seek after the Lord themselves, God will bless them too. And then their kids will be blessed. See what I mean? So, um, verse 8, A king who sits on the throne uh, of judgment winnows all evil with his eyes. And this is kind of what I was saying before. Proper judgment causes more people to obey. When you constantly... And when judges are constantly not enforcing the law, you see more and more of something. Right? There was that kid who raped that girl and got scot-free. And then, within about a year or two, we saw a bunch of other guys doing the same thing, and they all got off scot-free. Didn't we see that? The, um, a king who sits on the throne of judgment winnows all evil with his eyes. Gets rid of the evil just with a look in his eyes. Because th this, this king means business. He's here to set the record straight. He wants a righteous nation. He doesn't want uh, wickedness and evil to go rampant in the streets. But what's happened in today's culture is people are excusing everybody for sinning. Oh, rape isn't that big of a deal. What do you mean rape isn't that big of a deal? What? 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 <laughs> this is nonsense. And uh, so you're having kind of a tug of war in our culture. You've got some people who are going to the other extreme, you know. Feminism, for instance, who's not concerned with women equality, they're concerned with women superior superiority. So they're trying to do the same dumb thing that men have done in the past under the name of equal rights. But it's not equal rights. It's unequal rights. They're wanting retribution for the harm suffered. And I hope that this doesn't come off bad, but in my opinion, I think that the, that the Black, Black Lives Matter movement is doing something very similar. They're not wanting equal rights anymore. They're wanting to be treated as superiors. And in a healthy culture, I understand that bad things happened in the past, but in a healthy culture, that's not going to work. If you look at history and you look at how society works, it's not going to work. Okay, it's just not. You need something that brings more peace because what's going to happen is exactly what happened after World War One. The Germans were treated unfairly, and as a result, they got pissed off, and World War II happened. So let's say the Black Lives Matter does what it, what it wants to do, then you can have a bunch of pissed off white people that go and attack the black people. You can have the whole thing repeat over itself. Yeah. It's not going to bring a lasting peace. No. So I mean, what we need is to find some way to bring conclusion to that. Um, but anyways, I digress. My 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 point being obviously here about. Uh, taking care of, of immorality in a kingdom. Anyways, um, so that takes us to verse 9. Where is verse 9? Right here. Who can say I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. I mean, that one pretty much goes without explanation. It's pretty simple, you know. Nobody can say I, I have I have justified myself. Now, there are a lot of people who try to do that, you know. <laughs> oh, I don't need God. I'm a pretty good person. Okay, and you keep yeah. believing that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, anyways, and keep in mind, in, in Judges, this is a common repeating thing that God is the judge and he will repay immorality. Watch that in Judges, okay? I mean, Proverbs, in Proverbs. I, I got that backwards because we, it said the thing about the judge. Uh, verse 10, unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Now, because I brought up the Black Lives Matter thing, I think that I'm going to bring this up too. I've said about in, in the marketplace how, how they would weigh out the food against the shekels and stuff. You know, uh, okay. And that's obviously the, the, the immediate thing here. But this is also something that goes beyond that. Well, in court, when you give uh, uh, you know, a dishonest account, you know, obviously that too. But also, if you treat people with exception, one over the other, that's in a forum the same principle here, isn't it? When you treat a rich person better than a poor person, a man better than a woman, a white man better than a black man. So, I mean, any kind of, uh, of something like that could technically be an unequal weight, couldn't it be? If you think of it more broadly as a principle. So, now that would be a good example of something that's true, but not right to the proverb. To the proverb. Does that make sense? And I'm pointing that out because it is something that's true that I think isn't pointed out enough. That there does need to be equality. Okay. Um, if you ever get married, and if you ever get remarried, and if you ever get married, uh, you know, the idea that the man is the head of the house and he needs to, you know, have dominion over his wife, to an extent... To an extent, there always has to be someone in charge, you know, right. okay. But right. marriage has a lot more equality than I was led to believe as a child. And it has a lot more we need to make this decision more so than I need to make this yeah. decision. And I want to point that out because growing up, I wasn't really told that in the church or really anywhere. Uh, you know, I, I believed that it was, it was this thing of pressure for me. Yeah. It was something that I had to dominate the wife and I had to set things in order. I had to, well, then I got married, and I was like, wait, that's not biblical. Uh -uh. You know, and so I was trying to do this thing for the first part of my marriage. It wasn't even, 
wasn't even what I was supposed to be doing. But I thought it was what I was supposed to be doing. So, um, verse 12, uh, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Now, there's two interpretations to this proverb. The first is that God made, gave us our senses. Okay, But the second is that hearing is can mean obeying, and seeing can mean perceiving. So, in other words, um, if someone is able to, to uh, obey God and to perceive truth in, in, in life, that is something that's given to them by God. Their ability, their, uh, in other words, let me say this in a different way, because that would make it sound, so if we disobey God, it's because God didn't enable us to do it. That's not what I'm saying at all. But ultimately, the glory goes to God. If I am wise, it's because God's given me wisdom. If I obey the Lord, it's because God has, has worked in me and done, a, done, done something in me through the power of the Holy Spirit where I have been able to do that. See what I mean? Because when you first get saved, you're just a mess. But as you get as longer you're saved, like, you, you don't have problems with the same things that you used to. You have other problems that come up, but I digress. Again, Mr. verse... Uh, Mr. Levin. Then, uh... Oh, okay. Uh, even a child makes himself known by his acts, by what, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. And this is this is actually a lot more simple than I believed it to be. I had to get help on commentaries on this one. All it's really saying is that the actions reveal a person's heart. Even in a child, you can see you know what their heart is like by their actions. So, um, sorry. So where where was I that I skipped to? I guess I'm in thirteen now, huh? Okay. Um, Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you will have plenty of bread. Bad, bad, says the buyer, but when he goes away, then he boasts. So this is just, once again, just saying how things actually are. People, you know, when they're, what is it called? Uh, not conniving, but when they're um, bargaining, uh, you know, that's just a bargaining tactic that they use. There is gold in abundance. In other words, when you're selling something or buying something, you can't actually believe what the person's saying. We can do that job, but it's going to cost a little more than we planned. Hmm, no, I don't think it's going to cost you more than you planned. In other words, don't just believe, you know what I mean? Just take your card to the mechanic. Oh, it's going to cost $400. We discussed $300. You need to tell me why there's another $100 on top of this. Because they will do that. But I know them and I trust them. Well, then you're stupid because that's the process of bargaining. That's how it works. Now, there are some things that you can't really bargain with, like Walmart, for instance. Sometimes you can, like, hey, you marked it for this. You should give it to me for this price, since you had a mark for that price. But the grand majority of the time, they're going to tell you, well, that was the price as it was marked, and that was the price in the sales flyer, so there's nothing I can do. Or sometimes if it's a damaged good or something like that. Fifteen, there is gold in abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Wisdom is better than these things, which was said in the previous chapters, just repeated here in a different way. Uh, verse 16, take a man's garment when he has put up security for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for foreigners. Now, this sounds like he's saying, don't do good to other people. This is not what he's saying at all. He's talking about people who foolishly become responsible for others. He's not saying not to help people. Okay, He's saying, staking your well-being on somebody else's debts. You understand the difference? Take a man's garment when he... In other words, if somebody puts up security and says, like, oh, I'll co-sign on this person's loan... When it's a per when it's a stranger, it's not you know what I mean. It, then go ahead, and expe expect them to carry it through. You know their lack their lack of sense is what got it got it in and got them into that place. Um, and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for foreigners. And there's a little bit of a controversy on on how that should be translated. Some people say puts up security for an adulteress. Um, I'm gonna stick with for foreigners because the idea is the same. It's someone you don't know, and you're just co-signing on their loan, you're, you're carrying their loan, their debts, and you don't even know them. Um, but he said elsewhere not to take not to co-sign on loans anyways. Verse 16, take a man's garment when he has put up security. I'm sorry, verse 17, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be full of gravel. And this is once again a bigger principle. Lying and stealing don't satisfy, and the things that are brought through in moral ways don't satisfy. But here's a bigger, bigger lesson, okay, that even Ecclesiastes tells us. Sin is only fun for a season. At first, the bread is really sweet, but it goes bad fast. Um, verse 18, plans are established by counsel, by wise guidance, wage war. The idea of having counselors and people, you, uh, accountability partners, people you talk to about things, uh, people you talk to about your struggles, people who um, are trustworthy and godly, 
and will give you good advice. That is not just what you need to hear, I'm sorry, what you want to hear, but it is what you need to hear. Verse 19, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, now listen to this, because he's talked about the immorality of gossip and that kind of stuff. Now he's going to say something that, as far as, I've paid, as far as I've seen, he hasn't said this yet. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. I don't believe he said that in all of Proverbs so far. And the idea is this. Don't associate with those who have no control over their lips. Remember elsewhere he has said, don't don't hang out with uh, angry people because you're gonna learn you're gonna you're gonna become an, a short-tempered person. Uh -huh. Remember I said that earlier. Now it's the same principle with, with babbling. In other words, bad company corrupts good morals. When you hang around people, you're gonna be like those people. So who are you hanging around? Whoever, whoever right. So look at your friends, and you can bet that that's what you're gonna be like. Uh -huh. So. Oh. Um, okay. Okay, so I think that one's pretty simple there. Uh, verse 20, if one curses his father or his mother... Are you still writing that down? Uh, I know I'm fine. Oh, okay. If one curses his father or, or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. An, inherit an inheritance gained hastily... In Once again, this is something that, that repeats itself time and time again about respecting and honoring your parents. Now, as you grow up, that doesn't, you need to clarify, okay? That doesn't mean you have to do everything your parents say. What it does mean is you always have to respect and honor your parents, even if they're the worst people in the world. That's a hard thing to do. Uh, but, nevertheless, just because something hard is hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, right? Going to World War II was kind of hard for America to do. It just gotten over the Great Depression. World War I was kind of recent. People were not really wanting to go to war again. It was a hard thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. I mean, sometimes it's not about easy or hard, it's about right or wrong. Um, an, inherit, um, an inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Possibly like an inheritance too soon. Like, for instance, if a son demands inheritance from his father before the father is actually dead and, pat and on, it won't be blessed by God. Um, there are other possible understandings of it, so I'm not really going to stick to that too strongly. just wanted to throw that out there. Verse 22, do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will deliver you. If somebody wrongs you, let it go. Let God be the one who justifies that. Verse 23, unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord, and false skulls are not good. Very similar to what we've already read. Um, just kind of reiterates it. A man's steps are from the Lord. How then... I'm sorry, how then can man understand his way? And the idea here is actually quite lengthy, so I'm going to write it all down here. Blam. Yeah. First off, no man can choose his own life. You were either born into the household that you were, or you were not born into the household that somebody else was. You can't choose where you were born, you can't choose the situation in your life. For many people in the world, they can't even choose what to do with their life. And in America, you have the whole American dream, I can choose to do anything, but even then, you know, you can make your make these Thing, these plans and they fell, right? Have you ever had a plan and you and you tried to seek after and it failed? Even in America, um, no man can overtake what God has made. In other words, there's not a moment when God is not in control. The next, the two points in, uh, afford there. God is never not in control, and we are always dependent on God in our life. There's never a moment where we can say, "I got here by my own greatness." See what I mean? Um, God brings things by. That's another way that the thing that this is trying to say here. A man's steps are from the Lord. God is bringing by, things by that grow, that grow character and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, with all these things considered, how can man honestly believe I've got this? See, it's not our strength that, that brings these things about, because um, yeah, I think I've said everything that I wanted to say on that. That's why I make notes because that was a lot. That was a mouthful there. Verse 25, it is a snare to say rashly, it is holy, and to reflect only after making vows. And this is the idea of dedicating something in the heat of the moment. Have you ever gotten just caught up in worship or caught up in something and you just have the you you have uh, the good feelings and maybe even have, have goosebumps and stuff and you're just like, oh man, it's just good. And so you make a rash vow. Oh God, I'll do this. God, I'll dedicate this money to you. If you give me this job, you know, I'm, I'm going to dedicate my first paycheck to you and then bills come. I mean, so that's why he says here, um, it is a snare to say rashly, it is holy, and to reflect only after making the vow. Because um, you can give something to God, you don't have to make a vow beforehand. 
don't get caught up in the moment and, you know, say something stupid. So, oh, uh, verse 26. <clears throat> a wise king winnows the wicked and drives the will over them. Once again, the idea of getting rid of evil in the midst for the better of the good. Now, that's, once again, something that people don't want to hear nowadays. I think that's one of the reasons why people have the biggest problem with um, the Israelites killing the Canaanites. Not necessarily because it has anything to do with the babies dying, although that too. But I think the biggest problem that they have with it is, is exactly this. And I'll read it again. Um, they don't. They don't want to winnow the wicked. They want to give them more chances. They want to, you know, stick them in jail rather than rather than giving the the death penalty. Well, if they did something worthy of death, though, like I don't understand. And what what has happened is people have lost the value for people's lives. Now I'm not trying to stand on a soapbox, but this, this is something that's important. In America, people have lost the value for the human life. Uh, abortion is okay because there is no value to the, to a baby. It's okay for women to get raped because there's no value to a woman. It's okay for for a, for a man to, you know, uh, get on drugs and for for us to not who cares, Be, because they have no value. It's okay if someone dies of cancer because they have no value. So I mean, there there's this thing where we want to feel bad for people as long as it bothers us emotionally. But if it doesn't bother us emo emotionally, it's fine. It's fine. See what I mean? And you can't, you can't, you can't confine morality to your feelings. You can't do that. Either life has value in and of itself, or life only has value if you say it has value. Which is exactly what happened with the slaves. Blacks aren't really people. See? Exactly what happen, happens nowadays with abortion. Oh, baby, they're, they're fetuses. They're not really people. There's no value of human life. See what I mean? And so this is really important to understand. Don't expect the culture to treat people with, with, with like they're important. You treat people like they're important. You treat people like they have value. When you have encounters with people, with people who rub you the wrong way, people who steal from you, people who lie to you, bad people, remember, they have value even though they are not using that value very good. Remember that. Even a liar and a cheater has value. And sometimes you have to sacrifice, in government, you have to sacrifice people who have proven themselves wicked by their actions for people who have not yet done that. And it will deter sin, too. Once again, though, I'm not trying to argue for the death penalty. I'm just saying, you know, it's something that's necessary. We don't need guys to get on house arrest for raping a woman. We need them to get in trouble for raping, raping a woman. That woman has value in and of herself. That's not right. Anyways, um, so verse 27, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. This one confused me too. God uses our spirit so we can discern ourselves. In other words, he uses our conscience. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. It's not that, it's not that God is inherently in us. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that God has placed something in us to where we're able to search our innermost parts. And we're able to be searched in our innermost parts. This is the conscience. Animals don't have this. Plants don't have this. People uniquely have this. Okay? And that's why Jesus didn't come to die for animals, because they can't choose to do something immoral. So they can't, therefore, ask for forgiveness for their immoral action. They have knowledge, and they have characteristics, and they have personalities. But they still lack that conscience, that, that breath of life. Even though you're able to teach an animal... I, I saw this, and I'm going to get on my soapbox one more time. Sorry, guys, but I'm going to. Um, I saw this really funny thing. It, it said, these are my dogs. And it showed two really big dogs. And, and, and he said, I threw a stake down, and I told them not to touch it. The one that I've had for a while knew not to touch it. The other one tried to go and touch it, and the other dog got him in trouble and snapped napped at his neck and wouldn't let him touch the stake. And I didn't let them. I, I, had, them, I had them sit there, and they, and they could smell it, and they could see it, and they couldn't touch that stake. And I taught two dogs to do this, and you can't... You, you, you're telling me that we need to show grace to a man for not being able to not rape a woman? If a dog can refuse meat, I think a man can refuse sex. Just throwing that out there. Great, great post. I loved it. I loved it so much. 
See, the thing is, is our culture doesn't know what morality is. And the thing, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. But in wisdom, there is an, there is, it is impossible to separate morality from wisdom. We've looked at that. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. People in our culture want to say, I'm going to stand up for this because I believe that personally. But our culture is also relative. There's no absolute truth. So they have no basis for why they're standing up for something other than it bothers them personally. So you have some things that are completely overlooked. And what I'm saying is we as Christians have to stand up for things that are moral and stand against things that are immoral. That's why I still stand against, against the act of homosexuality. I understand people struggle. I'm not talking about having struggles. People struggle to look at porn. People struggle, you know, child molestation, stealing. I mean, people have temptations. I'm not going to deny that. But I'm still going to stand, stand for morality because there is a right and wrong in this world. And we need, to, we need to stand for that. I'm not saying we always have to start fights with people and we don't have to be wise with the words that we say. I actually, long story, I'm going to go back to that. Um... But with that being said, we have to stand up for morality. It is wrong to rape women. Well, everybody's standing up for that one, yeah. So stand up for, and stand up against homosexuality too. So, I mean, homosexuals deserve equal treatment in America. They, they deserve the right to get married. They deserve all that. Absolutely, they're people. Absolutely, the Constitution applies to all freedom, right? However, that doesn't make it just because something is legal doesn't make it moral. And we need to remember that. In, in my opinion. Abortion shouldn't be illegalized. I know that sounds really bad. But in trying to make it illegal, what's going to happen is it's going to cause people to not listen to the message of Jesus. And it's going to cause people to get into more of a place of hard-heartedness. And the American Constitution should apply to freedom, but in my opinion... That's not really freedom because you're choosing to end somebody else's life. But the culture doesn't see it like that. And so, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I go back and forth on this. Some days I say they should outlaw abortion. Some days, some days I say, well, maybe they shouldn't. And I'm kind of still half and half on this one. But with that being said, you know, our answer is not going to come in having our government stand up for things. Our answer is going to come by us standing up for something. We should be against abortion. We should show, teach people the value of human life. But we shouldn't expect our government to do the things for us. Um, steadfast lo st love and faithfulness preserve the king. And by steadfast love, his throne is upheld. If you're a leader, excuse me, if you're a leader, um, how you treat people will ensure that you are that you maintain your position and that you are enjoyed by people. Verse twenty nine: The glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their as their um, gray hair. Now, there's a few ideas here. First off, in this time, older people were kind of like sages. They were kind of like um, they had special places of honor. Um, if you lived that long, you got special places of honor, and so it would be like um, you go to the elders of your town. You know what I mean? Um, they verified legal things and that kind of stuff. If there was someone who's going to sell their property, for instance, um, they would do it in the hearing of the elders of the town. I think uh, Ruth, actually, I think when Boaz goes to buy the field from, um, what's his face? I can't remember. Uh, but anyways, I believe that the elders were there for that. But anyways, um, but uh, there's also another idea to this, the idea that if you live to be old, there's a good chance that either you've learned something or you live long enough to learn something. Anyways, uh, verse 30, blows that wound uh, cleanse away evil, strokes make clean the innermost part. Once again, the idea of punishment being necessary. Um, any questions on that? We're all good? I didn't go too late. 8.10, that's not bad. It's not good, but it's not bad. So the question of the week, should a fool who doesn't listen still be disciplined? And try to apply it in different situations. Okay, um, a worker who's just an idiot, um, a child who. Sorry. I thought we already answered this question. Well, I want you to look at it from a different angle, though. Uh -huh. um, a child who isn't going to listen. Um, when you're just a church discipline, should a leader discipline someone who's not going to listen, or should they just let it slide 
so that they can uh, keep the person in the church until they grow more. See what I mean? Think about it beyond the black and white that we've covered it already. Look at it with different eyes. Okay. So next week we'll do chapters 21 and 22. And no questions? Okay. You know, I'm going to take that back. Abortion shouldn't, abortion shouldn't be legalized. And the reason why is because freedom only extends to personal freedom. Once you trample on the, right, on the freedoms of someone else, that's not really freedom anymore. Right? Let's say, for instance, Gracie has complete freedom with a gun. She can do whatever she wants with that gun, so she decides to go and kill people. That's her right. She's got freedom in America. Yeah. Well, no. So, I mean, there does still have to be laws. So it doesn't make logical sense to say there should be freedom and there should be abortion. So I'm going to go back to my previous statement. Abortion should be legalized. Anyways, what were you going to say? But if it is still going to be allowed, there should be medical necessity. Yes. 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 This one, she gets it. She gets it.